sometimes I think people have gotten used to the idea that because of the nature of many Christians whose God is not real and is not alive and as personal as he should be, that somehow they think that they, by way of giving money, donating money, contributing money, that somehow the Christian God is a God of needing Christians and their money, their hands and their feet in order for him to do his work. That pisses me off. Now, it's not so much that I'm mad at the person, because I know that they're lacking in faith. I know that they don't have the experiences that I've had. I know that they don't live according to the scriptures that have been given them, but that they've watched TV somewhere and that they've seen how profitable it is for some Christian ministries to beg and plead and cajole to guilt people into passing out, you know, and receiving money. I know even from the church that I came from, which was a Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, they still wrestle with this issue because, you see, there was a time when nobody passed the plate, but it was all like in the back, you know, and you didn't really see where to contribute the money, you know, you just kind of, that wasn't part of the service. Now, because of the selfishness of Americans, you know, Christianity has taken on kind of a selfish persona by way of forcing the issue by saying, oh, well, now we need to pray over the money and make money a part of our worship. Well, it's not. Tithing and offerings is not a part of worship. You take care of that outside of the holy place. You don't deal with it inside. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Scripturally. Now, you can do whatever you want in your own religious observance if you want to take it into the holy place and make the God of this world, you know, if you want to call it that, paper money and checks and everything else going on in the service and interrupt the service so that you can get your money, even though most churches will say, well, we don't want to interrupt the service. We want worship to go and then the word to go. We don't want to interrupt it by, you know, distractions of people getting up and stomping and yelling and whatever. But if you're going to write a check, okay, well, you know, then you could go ahead and take the time to, to do that. But... We have a bulletin up there that says, next time, could you please, you know, take care of your checks and things beforehand? Uh, can we fill out, you know, everything and have it ready to go so that we put it in our little slip to pop into our little basket so that way we can make sure that the church sends you your receipt so you can get your 401k, you know, or you get your tax-deductible contributions in? I don't think so. You know, I think that if we were really honest about Christianity, we would stop taking money in and start giving it out. That if we were really true about our God, instead of giving money to the church, we would have the church give money to people. Instead of taking all this money in, we would give it out. We would say, hey, you know what? There's a people down the street that need their rent paid. You know, Let's all go pay their rent. And we go do it. We, as a body of believers. Because, you see, the Jewish model was one that you didn't have to contribute the money. The community knew to take care of itself. Christians, unfortunately, aren't that communal when it comes to getting to know the same people that are in their own church. So, everything is funneled through this kind of church secretary. And then the money has to come into the church so that the church could pay the secretaries in order for them to organize the money that's coming in, the money that's going out, the money that's being paid to employees that are working for the church so that they can get their non-profit status established so that they can go out and do their tax-deductible things so that they can make use of the world in its ways in order to accomplish the things that God says. I think maybe I just came from the wrong school. Maybe I got it wrong. Because, you know, everybody else, I mean, if you look around at where I'm at, everybody else seems to be pretty prosperous. I seem to be pretty poor. Of course, I'm kind of happy about it, you know. Me and Jesus, we tend to have kind of a personal intimacy that maybe I wouldn't get if I was, like, really involved in all this 
money taking in, money taking out, money here, money there, money everywhere. I've worked in many denominations and minis I mean denominations, many ministries, and yes, I, I know how it works. I know church management, I know the insurance things and all the other stuff that goes on behind the scenes. But is the business of Christianity really what we're all about? Is the administration of Christianity what we're all about? What if we just gave up the church and said, hey, you know what? We're going to, for every 10 people, we're going to put somebody in charge and let them lead the Bible study for a change. We're going to make sure you guys take care of yourself and meet in the homes and fellowship one with another. Get to know each other. Get to love one another, you know, and then we'll go meet in the park, you know. We'll go someplace where we don't have to have a building. We don't have to have a parking lot. We don't have to have monitors and elders and deacons and all these other people to do all these other things that all seem so most important to look like we're Christians. But maybe we're missing something by not being in the home when we moved out of the home to get into the business of Christianity. I wonder who's giving who the business lately. I know for myself, I in a ministry that asks no funds, takes no funds, distributes no funds, but does huge amount of work on the internet. I know for myself, I get requests from ministries consistently saying, oh, well, my God has cattle on a thousand hills and he's able, but I need to ask you for a thousand dollars, you know, so that you can help us feed the poor. Well, send them my way. They can come over to my house and have a sandwich. Or how about instead of feeding all those poor by collecting all this money from everyone else, why don't you one-on-one -on -one, take one person and instead of doing all the thousands, bring them to your home and feed them. You know, maybe share with them a little bit and care for them. When you're done with that one, maybe disciple them and teach them and instruct them and help them. Get them established, you know, give them a job, you know, help them on his feet, you know. Make sure that he's really well on his way. Take about a year or two to do that. Then move on to the next one. Maybe I have the wrong idea of ministry. Or maybe that's what Jesus did. Go and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and start up synagogues and congregations and temples and church structures and mega churches and campuses and be thousands of people assembled together in order to, and I'm not sure what, because you see in a small group, you would know who you're talking to and what they're talking about. But in a big group, I wonder if you know really what the person next to you is thinking. Or what they're getting. Or what they're doing. But we get a big church so that we can have little discipleship groups. Really. So, in the mega church, with the many ministries, do you think that the ministry is being accomplished that Jesus did with the twelve? Really? Maybe Jesus set an example that we are missing. And maybe we're going in the wrong direction by having all these ideas because of something we think we should do by getting thousands of people together because we got popular instead of teaching them to go out and have thousands of little, mini home Bible studies on a Sunday morning instead of a mega church the mega mass of money distributing for what again? I'm not so sure we're heading in the right direction. I'm not so sure that's what Jesus said to do. It's not what I do. The bow in the cloud. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. It is the will of God that human beings should get into moral relationship with him. 
and his covenants are for this purpose. Why does not God save me? He has saved me, but I have not entered into relationship with him. Why does not God do this? Why does he not provide the money for the ministry that I keep saying that I need in order to serve the ministry so that I can do what God has told me to do? He has done it. The point is, will I step into covenant relationship with him? All the great blessings of God are finished and complete, but they are not mine until I enter into relationship with him on the basis of his covenant. Waiting for God is incarnate unbelief. It means that I have no faith in him. I wait for him to do something in me that I may trust in that of what he has done, but God will not do that because that is not the basis of the God and man relationship. Man has to go out of himself in his covenant with God as God does go out of himself in his covenant with man. It is a question of faith in God, the rarest thing. We have faith only in our feelings and what we can see. I do not believe God unless he would give me something in my hand whereby I know I have it. Then I say, now I believe. There's no faith there. Look unto me and be ye saved. Whenever men of God keep coming to me and asking for money, I ask them straight up, you know, well, why? You know, why are you asking me, you know, of all people, you know, when in reality, if God brings someone across my path, I usually want to know, what is it you're not doing in relationship with your God to have a need that he can't meet that you have to go from God to ask me now for what you need? In other words, if God can't meet your need himself, how dare you ask his people to meet your need? How dare you, man of God, woman of God, minister, ministry? If God is providing, then God will take care of you. But if God can't provide for you, what are you doing? Are you saying, hey, you know, God told me to reduce the ministry down to a smaller size, but now I've got these bills, so I need to pay for this ornate structure, or I need to pay for this or pay for that, and I've got all these ministries that I need to pay for, and all these ministers and all these people that are depending upon me, so I need to tell everyone to give more money so that I can do what God can't do for me. Where God abides, God provides. I was told just today by a minister that after telling me his reasons for why he was right in challenging, cajoling, telling everyone why there were so many different ways he had to keep asking for money from people, that I said, well, it sounds like your God is broke and my God isn't, so I will pray for you and maybe he will answer you and take care of your needs because my God is able. So he wrote back, you know, and obviously was upset and said that uh, his God was the God of cattle on a thousand hills. And I thought, well, maybe his God ought to sell some of them because he doesn't have much money, but I guess he's got a lot of cattle. <laughs> I mean, what am I supposed to say? If God can provide for me, then why can't he provide for you? According to utmost, it's because of your relationship with him. Because God has said, I will be your provider. God has promised he would be our healer. God has promised that he would take care of our needs. God has promised all these things. So if the man had come to me and said, Thus saith the Lord, no, I'm kidding. If he came to me and said, you know, God has taken care of me and now I want to, out of the goodness of my own heart, reach out to other people. And if you want to join with me in doing that, then here's what we can do. You know, together we could share in these expenses and reach out and give what we have for someone else to receive from the Lord, you know, the blessings that we've been given. We'll give out of our abundance. You see the difference? We're giving out of our abundance. We're not giving money to support some guy in his ministry because he's got a good idea and he's going to run with it. 
I could do that. That's what a salesman does. That's what a promoter does. That's what the world does. When you go into ministry, choose not to be beholden to any other person, place, or thing except Jesus himself. And don't get involved in the world and its ways. Don't go for all these other things because there's ministries that I know I've helped set up that do not ask for money and are still around today 30 years later that minister to thousands freely as they were given freely they received freely they give so I don't get except to tell any minister or man of God if they're asking me for money go out and get a job and then take that money and put it in your ministry otherwise don't tell me about what God needs. My God doesn't need you, and he sure as heaven doesn't need me. It is a question of faith in God. We have faith only in our feelings. I do not believe God unless he will give me something into my hand whereby I know I have it. Then I say, now I believe. When I have really transacted business with God on his covenant and his terms and have let go entirely, then there is no sense of merit that I deserve it. There is no sense of need that I need it. And there is no human ingredient in it at all. But I am brought into union with God that he supplies according to his ability. And the whole thing is transfigured with peace and with joy and God receives the glory, not man. The ways of men are so sneaky and conniving. They're literally evil in some ways. But it's really not so much, I guess, evil as it is just the sin and the lust of the flesh that doesn't take the reality of God and who he is and makes him personal and real first before ever reaching out to someone else and giving a phony image of God as though he needs us to be hands and feet that he can't do for himself and he needs us to do. The book of Revelation reminds us that the gospel will go to the entire world by way of angels flying through the air, not by way of man taking it there. I'm sorry, but there's places that the gospel will not go because man will not go there. But angels flying in the heavens will declare the gospel, period. So, a lot of the Christianese ideas about prosperity, money, provision, tithing and offerings is really Christian religion and not so much any faith at all. Wouldn't you rather have a relationship with Jesus that shows your faith than to have a religion that doesn't show it at all? Thank you.